Hey guys, Matthew here. In today's video, we are going to go over every single one of the 369 divination cards that are currently available in Path of Exile. So this is going to be one of these other like longer theory-based videos. And so there's a lot of those divination cards that are outright bad. There's not much to say about them. Uh, so a lot of them we're going to be skipping through. Uh, but essentially, the goal of this video is to make you guys better traders, especially this is what I'm going to be focusing on. So if you're somebody who doesn't like the whole trading or flipping aspect of Path of Exile, this is probably not going to be a video for you. Uh, because otherwise, uh, you know, in terms of farming divination cards, this is just not something that you need to know. All you need to know is the location, but that's not what I want to talk about today. That being said, before I start the video and we start going over every single one of these divination cards, I do want to give you guys a bit of a uh, disclaimer if you will there's a lot of these different these different websites or these different applications that get divination cards wrong okay so the problem uh and there's 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 two problems with this so the first problem is that all of these different websites and applications and all that that, that will give you these kind of charts that tell you the profit margins on divination cards uh two main problems all right two big problems problem number one is that these numbers are all pulled from poe ninja okay so that's the first problem and the, the the problem with that is the poe ninja is very very inaccurate uh first off it it doesn't take in consideration a lot of these uh, different aspects of these different uniques for example and not only does it not take in consideration aspects like is it corrupted or not if there's like that or like does it have an implicit is it you know whatever uh does it have a good role things like that but also the second reason is uh that it's easy to actually manipulate these prices uh, if you have enough capital, right? It's actually not that hard to basically change these numbers and you can change them pretty drastically. Uh, if you wanted to, you can make a headhunter look like it's a 2C item if you had enough headhunters, right? If you had more headhunters than anybody else. So there is a lot of uh, groups and dedicated people who uh, basically manipulate these prices when they are working on a given market. I'm not saying that all of these prices are wrong. I'm saying that they can be wrong at a given time when people actually... Uh, you know, put efforts into changing these prices ever so slightly uh, and sometimes more dramatically as well. All right, here's an example of what I mean by that. If we look at our POE Profit right now, which I do think is a great application, a great website, but I would highly recommend uh, not you pay attention to the divination card. Uh, it's, let's see, Burning Blood, right? Burning Blood is one of the top contenders for profit here. It says that it has a cost of 108 chaos. This is for the whole set. Six Burning Blood cards at 18C each. Uh, and the revenue is 246 chaos, right? Which would be a burning of blood uh, for a return on investment 137%, which is amazing, right? You're, you're doubling your money. You're over doubling your money. Now, here's the problem. Th the problem here is that exhaust blood is at 2.3x or 256.4 chaos, which is exactly what you're seeing on this website, right? Because this website is pulling the data from POE Ninja, but POE Ninja is wrong. Therefore, this is also wrong. Right. The reality is that if you look at exhaust blood right now, if you look at, you know, not necessarily non corrupted or anything like that, you'll see that there are some of these for 1.2 X. Now, 1.2 X means that if you're paying 108 chaos, right, uh, for for these cards, at 18 C, and that's if you're able to get them at 18 C, uh, you're paying 108 chaos, you are going to be getting about 120 chaos back. Uh, and these are corrupted, which means that they're harder to sell uh, because of the corruption and because well now of course with the new from last league uh oil the corrupted oil whatever it's called it does make it so you can anoint corrupted items but it is still harder to sell uh because it also cannot be divined right so this one for example has very low fire resistance uh this one has uh this one also has very low fire resistance and you know it has a hatred or effect on exhaust blood which is completely useless right so why would someone go out of their way to pay 1.2x it's probably not just not going to sell, right? Unless someone is absolutely desperate or if they undercut low enough. Now, of course, you do need to look at the flip side. There is obviously the option that you get a really good implicit, something like, for example, fire damage uh, leeches life, right? Uh, for example, uh, I don't know, like anger or effect, right? Things that are actually useful for the builds that do use those blood. And in that case, you are actually have potential for some jackpot, if you want to call it that. Uh, so it is very important, but in my opinion, this is not the way to go. The, it's it's a good resource to use to then verify the same way I did this, right? You look at it, it looks really good. Then you go out and verify, is it really as good as it sounds? Uh, in most of the cases, the answer is going to be no, uh, which is why it's, it's very important to be careful with these charts. Now, let's talk about the actual divination cards. 
So, three phases in the dark, nothing to say there. It's a seven card for, for three chaos. This is completely ignored. Uh, the Doctor is for Headhunter. So, this is a very good flip. Typically, it starts around day four, day five. Most of the time, before that, nobody really has the, uh, the capital to buy a Headhunter unless you, like, drop a mare or you drop a Headhunter and sell it. But then if you do that, why would you want another Headhunter, right? Uh, so, Doctor flipping... Uh, is not really a thing until around the end of the first week when people start to have a lot more capital. Uh, before that, the people who are buying doctors are typically either groups or just uh, people who are pushing for currency in order to get their own headhunter, not to sell it for profit. Uh, but there's typically some pretty decent margins of profit to be made. Typically, a headhunter, once finished, if you buy a doctor card and you sell the headhunter, you should be making somewhere around 0.5x per card, so about 4 exalt for a headhunter, which doesn't sound like that much, uh, when you're considering that you're putting anywhere between 70 to 80 exalts most of the time into buying that headhunter So your actual margin of profit is very small in terms of percentage But if you have the capital for exalt is very very good money for a single item flipped and they do sell pretty You know reliably and pretty quickly headhunters that is um, Around the end of the first week So it's definitely a card that you do want to keep in mind when you are flipping and you have a lot of currency uh, the Hermit is a 9 card for Life Sprig, nothing to say here. 7 cards for Ram, uh, Rare 2 Stone Ring, nothing to say there. Metal Miss, uh, Metalsmith, also garbage. Uh, Battle Axe, or sorry, the Battleborn. So this is one of these that gives you basically a random unique of a given, uh, of a given, uh, sorry, category, like axes, you know, wands, daggers. They're all bad, right? Because the odds of getting anything remotely decent compared to the odds of not getting anything decent because these cards are all weighted is just bad. Therefore, uh, this is these are always going to be bad in my opinion. The Gladiator, uh, I actually mentioned that one as an example that I gave in my previous video. The Gladiator is not bad because there is only two outcomes uh, on the Nightmare Bassinet, right? There is the Bringer of Rain and there is the Devo Devoto's Devotion. So in leagues where Devoto's Devotion is very, very expensive, uh, which is not very common, but it does happen. Legion League, for example. Uh, it is a very good flip because it's a 50-50, so you can do the math pretty easily on your uh, potential for profit. Meanwhile, Bringer of Rain is almost never good, uh, considering it's been nerfed numerous times. The Scholar, 40 Scroll of Wisdom for 3 cards. I mean, there is actually something to be said here if you turn these Scrolls of Wisdoms into Portal Scrolls and sell the Portal Scrolls. Some people like to buy Portal Scrolls in bulk. But again, in my opinion, it's not really something you should ever, you know, stop and do uh, because the, the profit margins are way too small. All right, so any one of these that give you a unique which is corrupted, you do basically need to probably take the item itself, the Vol's Devotion. And what you'll want to do, and this applies to basically any corrupted item that you'll be getting from these sets of divination cards, you probably want to remove about 20% of the value of the item. So let's say Vol Devotion is 100 chaos. Well, you probably want to consider a corrupted one at about 80 chaos because you're losing, you're definitely going to lose some margin of profit due to the fact that it's corrupted. Why? Because again, it's it's more expensive to anoint it. At least now you can, but it's still more expensive. And of course, uh, you can't forget about the fact that you can't divine it, which is typically a, a big deal. But if we look at it, uh, Vol's Devotion. Now, Vol's Devotion has not really been meta for a very long time, I believe, uh, but if Vol's Devotion was good, this is definitely a card which you can keep in mind. Again, though, remember about removing that 20%. Uh, the Poets for Blood of the Corruption. Blood of the Corruption is uh, not something that is worthwhile. Uh, it's easy to get a... Uh, if we look at the actual Blood of the Corruption, for the people who don't know what that is, it's actually an amulet that is made from corrupting, uh, corrupting the, uh, the Tear of Purity, right? If you corrupt the Tear of Purity, there's a chance that you get Glove, uh, Blood of Corruption. Now, this amulet is really only used by supports in Deep Delving uh, because it gives you gluttony of elements, which can make you basically immune to all. The Crystal King allow you to basically face tank him because what this does is that you heal off of elemental damage. Uh, so you make it so your character is taking mostly elemental damage and, and no physical, and then you can basically, uh, you're, you're basically immune during the duration of gluttony of elements. Uh, but it's not exactly an amulet which is uh, you know, widely used by anybody outside of that specific function. Uh, pretty cool to know, however, that Blood of Corruption was a unique that was designed by Chris Wilson himself. Okay, uh, so next we have the Karen Crow, Life Armor. We're not going to care about that. Hope for Prismatic Ring. This is kind of the same situation where it's there's not too many outcomes, right? But the problem is, 
Uh, Lori's Lantern is absolutely worthless, and Teeth, uh, Teeth Stormant is absolutely worthless most of the time, and Taming is not that expensive. And remember, this is weighted, right? It's not equal chances to get any of them. Typically, you're going to get Lori's Lantern or Thief's Stormant. The Taming is going to be a lot more rare. Uh, so it's, in my opinion, not something that's worth going out of your way to try to, uh, to flip, especially because it is a 5 Divination card set, and it does come Corrupted. The fact that it comes corrupted, again, can't be divine and all that, does make it uh, less valuable, and it's already not uniques that are typically too, too valuable in the first place. All right, Fiend is the same thing for the Headhunter. Take a Headhunter, remove about 20% of its value, uh, and then, uh, you know, do the math on it, right? 11 cards, let's just say they're 5x each, that's 55x. If a Headhunter is around, let's say, 70x, chances are you're going to make a good bit of profit with these because you can also get very good implicit, right? For me, the whole thing about removing the 20% profit or 20% value is about being safe. It's about being safe and thinking in the worst case scenario, am I losing money, right? Because anytime you're flipping the divination card, that's the, that's the one thing you want to think about. In the worst case scenario, will I lose currency? Uh, and in, in, in this case, so long, or in any case, so long as that 20% rule is, is uh, accurate, right? then you are probably going to be making currency, but the Fiend is a very, very good card. Now, the advantage of the Fiend is that it's an 11 card set versus the Doctor card, uh, which means that typically it's cheaper early. So what that allows you to do is to buy this uh, the Fiend card earlier than to buy the Doctors. It's typically a lot underpriced compared to the Doctor cards. It holds less value early in a league. Uh, a Doctor card might be 6 to 8x in a league start scenario, while a Fiend might be somewhere like 3 to 4. So there's typically a lot more value if you can buy these cards early compared to buying Doctors. Uh, so again, if you have a lot of currency early, it's definitely not a bad thing to invest into. Most of the flippers, uh, before they even consider Doctors, what they'll do is they'll complete a Headhunter with the Fiend, they'll sell that, and then they'll use that currency to start doing Doctors instead. All right. Uh, Birth of the Tree for the Goddess Bound is absolutely not something you want to think about. It's garbage. Five uh, five cards here for Venerius Token for 10 or Regrets. Bad. Uh, Summoner for a 20% quality Minion Gem for 6 cards. Bad. Cataclysm for a 21 Spell Gem. It would be good, but it's a 13 card set, which is not, absolutely not worth the time. The Hunger. Okay, so this is one of the ones that is actually very, very good in a League Start scenario. You can basically pour your first Chaoses into this, and you will always make money. Uh, so Taste of Hate, actually, now that there's there's been this whole huge flask nerf, Taste of Hate is actually one of the flasks that got nerfed the least. Uh, but the thing about Taste of Hate is that it is pretty specific. You need to be playing a physical converted to coal build to really get the most value out of it. Uh, and, you know, there's not that many of those builds. But for a 9 card set, for a Taste of Hate, uh, if you can get these cards for like a Chaos each, typically you are going to be getting anywhere between 40, 50 to 100% return of investment on these cards. Uh, so... A lot of people ask me all the time, how do you get started? Taste of Fate is one of those cards that you really want to keep in your arsenal because there is uh, a lot of uh, potential on this card. Now, remember what I said in my last video. It's all about every single Chaos Matters in a League Start scenario, especially for the first few hours. So if you can get this card for a Chaos each and get your Taste of Fate for 9 Chaos and sell it for even 15 Chaos, well, guess what? You had 9 Chaos and now you've got 15. You nearly doubled your money. It's only 6 Chaos, but those 6 Chaos allow you to make almost 2 of these uh, flasks now. And then once once you get to that point, essentially you basically made a flask for free, right? You start with 9C, you get 15, then you make another one for 9, you get another 15. So now what you have is basically 15 plus the leftovers, which was 6, right? So you've got 21C. And there you go. You can actually make two of these, and that's where you start snowballing. That's all what it's about when I say uh, when I talk about snowballing. All right, Hoarder is typically a decent card, uh, especially early, but it is a 12-card set for a single exile. And the problem is here that these cards that are based on currency are typically going to be botted pretty heavily. Now, this is something that sucks, uh, but the reality that bots are, are not very good at, at flipping things like, for example, the Honigur card because there's a lot of dynamic uh there, it's very very dynamic these markets something like currency it's very very easy uh for a script to do the math for you right okay H hoarder card 4c that's you know 48c uh and and, and exalt 52c therefore 4c profit right uh so it's it's going to be botted very very heavily especially in the league start scenario but all the way through the league uh, now, typically, the Hoarder is not the best one because it's a 12-card set for a single Exalt, but any of them that give you raw Exalts are typically not going to be something that's very good to look at too, too much. 
All right, the Drunken Aristocrat for Divination Distance, eight card for Flask Worth of Chaos. How about no? The Sun, seven card for Rise of the Phoenix, also a big no. Rise of the Phoenix has, hasn't been very meta for a very long time. That being said, if Rise of the Phoenix ever saw a massive surge in popularity, it's something that you could consider. Corrupted Amulet, rare for four cards. I don't know who would ever care about this. This Garamido, uh, nine cards for Wake of Destruction, which are garbage boots. No thanks. All right, the Dark Mage is a five-link staff item level 55. There's really not a whole lot you could do with that. But one thing to note, which is kind of funny, is about these five-link divination cards is that they all they always come with six sockets, which means they can be vendored for um, seven jewelers. That being said, seven jewelers for a six-card set, it's just not worth it, right? So that's one that you would absolutely um, throw away. Uh, the Gem Cutter, a Gem Cutter's Prism for three cards, again, not worth the Gambler, a random divination card for five cards, absolutely not worth. The Lover. So this is one that was actually pretty popular uh, a while ago when the Chaos Recipe was extremely popular. I believe this card drops in the Haunted Mansion map or something like that. Uh, and it's a really, 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 really common card. Uh, so people were doing, like, basically, uh, I, I believe it was Delirium, putting Delirium uh, on their map. And uh, just farming tons and tons of these, which will allow them to do Chaos Recipe. But overall, it's a very bad strategy, uh, especially nowadays with the price of Exalts. All right, Chaotic Disposition. It's one card for 5C. I don't think it's ever going to be flippable. Typically, people would just turn it in. Uh, the Road to Power, a runic one hand weapon of a given item level. So this is the same situation where pretty much all of these are going to be bad. And the reason for that is that when it says a runic or a merciless or whatever it is, and then it says some one-hand or two-handed weapon or a body armor or anything like that, you don't know the base that you're going to get. That's not too big of a problem when it comes to armor, but when it comes to weapons, the bases are basically just as important as what's on them. So these are always going to be pretty bad, and especially for a seven-card set. All right, the Avenger for a Corrupted Mjolnir. Now, there's a chance that this could be good. There's some decent corruption on Mjolnir, for example, Fortify on hit. The problem is, it's a 12-card set, uh, and there are many very bad corruptions that you're going to lose all, like, the entirety of your money. And remember, when it comes to corrupted, especially weapons, where the rolls matter a lot, uh, there's not going to be any real uh, value there. So this is one that I would not uh, consider too, too much. Emperor's Luck, 5 random currency for 5 cards. That's awful. You don't want to think about that. Any one of the ones that are not specific, like this, for example, a league-specific item for 10 cards. Let's just say they're 1C each. That's 10C for a league-specific item. Sure, it could be a headhunter, but it could also be uh, all 99 other percentage of complete trash uniques that are worth absolutely nothing. So in my opinion, this is not worth it either. You'll see it, You'll see basically that during the, this video, a lot of it, it comes down to whether it's uh, gambling or sorry, if it's gambling, it's basically completely thrown out the window for me. All right, Lucky Connection, seven cards for 20 fusings. Now, there is sometimes where this card can actually be quite good. Imagine this, let's say fusings are, uh, I don't know, 1.3 per chaos or something. I've seen that. We've seen that in, in previous leagues, actually. Sometimes fusings become very, very expensive if there's a sort shortage of them, especially early league. Uh, let's just say this divination card is one chaos each. That means you can get a set of 20 fusings for seven chaos. And let's just say they're even two to one, right? Two fusings. That would mean that this card here, these 20 fusings would be worth 10 chaos, meaning you'd be making three chaos, which at that point is 30%, right? 30% more currency than you started with uh, or just about. So it's actually not a bad idea to definitely uh, pay, uh, pay attention to lucky connections, or I should say pay attention to the price of fusings. And of course, the price of this divination card, uh, because it is a seven card set, which does take a little bit of time to buy. Uh, but especially when fusings are really expensive, this can be really good because this this example I gave you is two to one. But let's say fusings are I don't know 1.5 to one, then you're making a lot more profit. So this is definitely one that has potential. The feast five cards for a bad ring and it's corrupted. That's obviously awful. Eight cards for a chaos. That's obviously awful. Uh, Twelve cards for a one so unique. That's bad. Four cards for whispering ice. That's bad. Uh, nine cards for five regals. That's pretty bad. Okay, K King's Heart. Now that's a good one. This is definitely one that you want to keep in your arsenal, especially in a league start scenario. I'm talking the first day of a league. This one is typically going to be quite good because there's a lot of builds that require Combs Heart to really get some tankiness into their build. And even in some cases, if they're fire related builds, uh, it's also quite good for damage. Uh, so the thing about Combs Heart is you'll want to do the same thing that I said, right? 
earlier. Uh, you don't want to be paying attention to, for example, with, with this website or any other website is going to tell you is going to be the profit margin. You'll want to look directly yourself. What is the price of a non-corrupted Combs Heart? And then, uh, you, you know, you do the math. You take that price, you divide it by eight, you look at the price of the cards. If there's a margin, that's your profit. Now, another thing you need to note is that m rolls matter here, right? If you get a 20% fire damage roll, it's going to be worth a lot less than if you get a 40% fire damage roll. Uh, so you want to look at the worst case scenario because then anytime that you get something that's not worst case scenario, you're basically getting a bonus. As long as you're making currency in the worst case possible, then that's always a very good deal. So King's Heart is very, very solid. All right, Bend and Wealth, five cards for three Exalted Orbs. This is one of the other ones that is typically going to be botted pretty heavily. Very, very hard to, to actually flip those as a regular player. Uh, because of the amount of people and bots that are actually going to be uh, on it already. Now, these cards, one thing to note about these Exalted cards is a lot of the time they are price fixed. Uh, so you do want to pay attention if you're a player and you're trying to sell your own. You do want to pay attention if you get sp uh, spammed for this divination card as soon as you put it up. There's a good chance that it's currently being price fixed, which is unfortunate, but that's just the nature of the game. Uh, so yeah, pay attention to the value of your items. Uh, but yeah, hard to flip. That being said, if you can get the currency to start flipping those early, it's only five cards for three exalts, uh, and they are extremely cheap cards, uh, when it comes to very, very early in a league, uh, because obviously exalts have very little value, but there's not that many exalts around. Meanwhile, there can be many of these cards. And the wind, seven cards for a wind ripper. Now this can be good, but it can be bad. It depends on the price of the card, depends on the price of the wind ripper. This is one that is has lost a lot of its value uh, in recent times. If over the last year or so, it seems like Windripper basically um, pretty much lost the entirety of the people who are using it, except for magic find characters, right? Deck stacking bows and like plus three bows and all that are just outright better, way better for damage. Uh, so, and, and low tier mapping with magic find has lost a lot of its popularity. So it's not really a great card anymore, but it's one that you can keep in mind uh, because there are some leagues where uh, people will hype up, you know, uh, Magic Find, and therefore, let's just say the card is a Chaos, and Wind Ripper is like 12C, you're nearly doubling your money. There's definitely going to be some potential there. So one that you do want to keep your eyes on, uh, but not pay too, too much attention to, and don't focus on it. Just have a look once in a while. Uh, the Pact is a very good one in the League Start scenario. Actually, probably one of the better cards, I would say. Now, of course, with the mana changes, with the Archimage changes and all that, uh, it's lost a lot of its popularity, but it's still one that you obviously want to have in your arsenal. Pledge of Hands, super, super, super strong and solid uh, staff in a League Start scenario. Now, it is a 9-card set, which makes it slightly annoying to buy. Uh, there can be some price fixing going on and all that, but typically the, the, the Pact is one that you absolutely want to keep in mind. Uh, gem Cutter's Prism, a random gem with 20% quality. There's too many chances that the gem is going to be completely trash. Uh, and the quality is only worth basically one GCP, right? If you vendor a 20 quality gem, so it's not very good. All right, Celestial Justice card and just about any other divination card that gives you a six link is going to be very, very, very good. And remember to always split them using the Phenomal Plague Arachnid in order to double the value of these divination cards, right? Let's just say that you can buy this whole set for 80 C and the split beast is 40 C. Well, once you split this, the, the, the outcome of this, you now have 160 C value, but instead of having paid 160 C, you've only paid 120 C, right? And of course, typically there's always going to be a margin on top of that. So you do want to remember to, to, uh, to, to split any one of these six links if they are not uh, influenced or corrupted or anything like that from these divination cards. Uh, the six link astral is a very, very solid one. Now, the thing about uh, turning in divination cards is that they respect your character level up to level 80. Once you're level 80, no matter if you're level 80 or, or 99, uh, there's no difference when turning in this divination card. It's always going to give you an item, which is item level 80. And this is problematic because most of the really, really good mods, things like T1 resistances, but also things like influence modifiers, are typically going to be higher level required than 80. So this is a, this is a divination card which is really, really good for early game because you can craft these uh, without influence and without any of the expensive modifiers that are going to be sought after later on in the game, like mid-game or even just a few days into the league, 
but this is going to be a really, really solid option for things like life and tri res chests, which you can craft with obviously essences, probably one of my favorite when it comes to crafting chest pieces, but also things like fossils or even harvest reforges and whatnot. Uh, and then you can get a very decent you know, six link astral, which is already a good base, giving you 36, uh, 36% re elemental resistances. And then with some rife and res on there, you can sell these for a pretty decent uh, profit margin. You do need to note though, that this card doesn't stay very good for very long. This is like a day one thing, but on the first day of a league, it's one that you absolutely want in your arsenal. Same situation for the change that bind. The only difference is that it's an 11 card set. It's typically going to be much cheaper than the celestial justic card because this uh, the chest piece here is also level 80, which means it's not very good, but it's also random, right? It's just a six link body armor. You don't know the base. You don't know what base it's going to be. You don't know if it's going to be uh, evasion, int, or armored, and you don't know if it's going to be something that's absolutely horrible, or it's going to be something like really good, like for example, an astral plate. You just don't know. But remember, early game, people don't really care too, too much about the bases. They care about the stats on the item, right? And they also don't care about any sort of influence modifiers. They just want life and resistance and stats, right? strength, dex, and whatever they need on their build. So it's always going to be a very, very solid option and typically much cheaper than the Celestial Justicar. Card. You can get these cards for about 1 to 2C each in a League Start scenario. Meanwhile, this one here is typically more like 8 to 10C. So there's a very, very big difference there. All right, the art is uh, always going to be pretty decent. Depends on the price of the level 4 enhance. It's 11 cards, and it is um, pretty rare, this Divination card. Uh, so typically, the en Enlightened and Empowered version of this card are going to be a lot better. But the enhance is also one that can be good if it is a meta uh, skill gem, which typically it's not going to be. Uh, but it's one that you do want to keep in mind. But mostly the Enlightened and Empowered version, which we'll talk about uh, later on. The Inventor, 6 card for uh, 10 Valor. It could be good if Valor were extremely expensive, but that just never happens in a League Start scenario. Nobody really needs Valor until they get to much later, like in red maps, when they start to Valor their maps for Atlas completion. Otherwise, not exactly something that you care about. Pack Leader. Now, this one is surprisingly good uh, because Alpha's Howl, is, this is a day one divination card, okay? You want to focus on this one extremely early, and the reason for that is that Alpha's Howl has a lot of value in a League Start scenario because it's extremely important for aura bots, who are typically going to be playing in groups and therefore have currency to gear their character, to get their Alpha's Howl as fast as possible, right? So this Divination card has a ton of value in the first half of the first day of the league, right? So it's, it doesn't last for very long, but you can get this Divination card for like a Chaos, and typically Alpha's Howl might be anywhere between 15 to 20, uh, so you are going to be making a very, very good amount of profit on this divination card if you are, um, if you're paying attention to it. And of course, you know, Alpha Sal is in demand. Now, again, though, even as early as the second half of the first day of a league, typically people are going to be later on in their mapping session and they're going to start uh, getting a lot more of these uh, uniques and therefore Alpha Sal is going to drop in value a ton. Jack in the box, random item, never going to be good. Uh, Union, seven seven cards for 10 GCPs. There's just not enough profit to be made there. Uh, Azirius Acuities for 16 cards is typically very, very strong, uh, but it does depend on the meta and whether Azirius Acuities are good or not, right? Uh, but I've had some leagues where I've made over 100% profit margin on these cards. Now, the annoying part about these cards is that there's 16 of them to buy and they are pretty rare. I believe they drop from Azirius herself or something like that. So what happens is that you need to draw, you need to buy 16 of them, and they're rare. So typically, you'll be able to get some for cheap. But then by the time you've bought 16 of them, the price has risen up a lot. So you can't just like pump out these Azir Acuities from this Divination card. But it's one that you absolutely want to pay attention to, especially when Azir Acuities are very, very meta and sought after. There's a lot of potential there, one that I would absolutely keep in my arsenal. All right, Humility is one that's pretty good on the first day of a league. Typically, a very good way to start because one of the first things people invest into is going to be a six link, right? Getting the damage going. Uh, so, because of that, Humility is typically a pretty good option to consider. That being said, in recent leagues, it's been botted pretty heavily. It's kind of hard to buy these cards at a decent margin. Uh, but, again, remember what I said in the last video, every chaos matters, therefore it's okay. The Explorer, a random map, uh, corrupted for six cards, absolutely not worth. Dictator's Prophecy Wand. Now, in this case, we do know that it's a Prophecy Wand. The problem is a Prophecy Wand is a really good wand base for spells, and Dictator's is about Fizz. Uh, it's a bad base for things uh, like Attack Speed and Crit. Therefore, this, this is just awful. 
All right, Betrayal for Malagaro's Virtuosity is actually very, very good in leagues where Malagaro's Virtuosities are, uh, you know, sought after, which is typically the case when it comes to uh, early game because a lot of people want them to start going uh, or stackers because it gives them, you know, 300% critical strike multiplier on base and they have to invest into no other crit multi anywhere on the build, which is a very good budget option for or stackers and stuff like that. Uh, so Betrayal is definitely one that you need to keep in mind. But it is a fairly rare card. Now, the thing is, it drops in a map which a lot of people tend to love farming, which is Burial Chambers, uh, if I remember correctly. Therefore, there is definitely some pretty uh, decent margins for profit and definitely enough supply on the market, typically anyways. So it's one that you do want to keep an eye on. All right, Floor's Gift, the same situation here. Five link, no one cares. It's, a five, link, uh, it's five cards as well, so it's just not worth it. Seven cards for a Corrupted Bad Item, no one cares for the Siren. Uh, six cards for La Hoop of All. Now, there was a, there was a time where La Hoop of All was uh, a very, very solid ring. But with the, you know, the coming of things like influenced items and whatnot, it's lost uh, pretty much all of its use, uh, usability. So it's not really worth it anymore, especially because it's an iron ring, if I remember correctly, which is not a very good base. Uh, so yeah, the one with all, not too good. All right, the last one standing is typically a very, 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 very good card for extremely early league. I'm talking, again, like the first half of the first day of a league. It's one of these cards which is going to be very good to get going. A lot of the time, this card is going to go for about 3 to 4 chaos in a league start scenario, which means that you can complete the set for anywhere between 30 to 40 C. And if you do that before the vast majority of people start farming Uber and Ziri, uh, you are basically going to get to dictate the price of the axe, which in most cases is going to sell for around 60 to 70 C, which means you're going to be making anywhere between 20 to 30, even 40 C profit on the whole set, which is very, very solid. One that I would absolutely keep in my arsenal. I do mass and madness is bad. It's an item, so you don't know what you're going to get. And it's a nine card set. Random map, eight card set, not good. You don't know what you're getting. The wrath. 10 Chaos for 8 cards is just overall not worth it. Even if you got the cards for 1 Chaos, you're still basically only making 2C, uh, which is kind of just not really worth it. And buying these cards is annoying because you need ten, uh, you need 8 of them to just get 2C. Not great. All right, Kingblade is an Eternal Sword, which is a horrible base, and Bloodthirsty is pretty good, but item level is bad, so you can't really get any good thing with it, so it's not, not good. The Trial is a random T15 map for 7 card. Now, this can actually be a pretty good card... Uh, in a league start scenario, not necessarily f so much as uh, for flipping and making profit, but as a uh, as a uh, pusher, as somebody who's actually playing the game, uh, it can be pretty good to bypass a lot of the atlas, right? So let's say that you are going for a strategy which revol revolves around getting to T14, T15 maps as fast as humanly possible in order to be able to uh, go farm Uber and Ziri for some maps, right? Well, the thing about Uber and Ziri is that it respects the, the Atlas rules. So if you go into an Uber and Ziri, which is a level, I believe, 13, T, a T13 map uh, zone or something like that, T13, T14, you should be able to drop maps that are high tier red maps. The problem is, if you've never completed one of these map tiers, like at all, right, at T12, 13, 14, 15, if you've never completed one of these map tiers whatsoever on your Atlas, even if you have some of these map tiers on your Atlas because you socketed Watchstones, they cannot drop. So you do need to have a completed map of a given tier, just one, to enable these to be able to drop outside of... Uh, outside of your actual mapping itself. So, one of the really good thing about the trial is that what you can do is, uh, you know, work your way up to the Atlas to be to, to the point where you think you're going to be able to kill, like, Uber and Ziri, right, and be ready to go boss. Uh, and then, let's say you're, you're only in T10, T11 maps. Well, you can basically put four Watchstones in a given region, buy this set of, buy this, this Divination card set, clear that T15 map, hopefully you'll be able to drop an adjacent T13 or T14 or whatever, then you clear that, and from there on, you can officially go and farm your Uber Ziri, and you'll actually be able to drop high tier red maps, which is a, uh, I would say, uh, the majority of the money you're going to make is going to be from mapping, uh, from maps uh, when, when early killing a Ziri. All right, Gentleman is four card for a Corrupted Sword. You don't know what you're going to get. It's Corrupted. It's bad. House of Mirrors is one that a lot of people get baited into buying early. Uh, the problem with House of Mirrors is that people understand that the value of the House of Mirrors is only ever going to go up. So what tends to happen in a League Start scenario, especially for the first week, maybe in the first two weeks of a League, is that this card is going to be very, 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 very overpriced compared to the value of Mirrors. And 
The reason for that is very simple. This is essentially like buying a mirror pieces at a time. Uh, but because people understand that mirrors are going to go up in price very, very quickly compared to you know some random other uniques, uh, they are going to be overpricing this card. So House of Mirrors is actually a card which I would say you should stay away from if you're planning on uh, basically flipping it or reselling it early. That being said, if you plan on just buying these and just sitting on them for the rest of the league or for a very long time, then it's actually a worthwhile investment uh, if you're not able to buy things like mirror shards or just outright buying a mirror. All right, Wealth and Power, I've already spoken about this. It's the same thing as the Enhanced one, except it's for Enlightened. This one is typically a lot better. This one is actually very, very good. Uh, but the annoying part is, again, it's a rare div card, and there's a set of 11. So if you buy out all 11 of them, typically you're going to push the market up a lot, which is annoying. All right, Catalyst, bad three, uh, you know, set, uh, three cards for Valor, whatever. The Vast Sign of the Sirens, which is a just a, a fishing rod for seven cards, bad. Uh, Gift of the Gemling Queen, a random support gem, nine cards, bad. Dragon's Heart, same same exact situation than the other two, but it's for Empower. Very, very good card. We made a ton of currency from flipping this one, uh, this league ourselves. We we're making uh, about 1.5x per 11 cards that we were buying, so it was very, very profitable. Uh, one that you absolutely want to keep in mind, but again, if you go out and buy too many cards, you're going to push the value up. All right, the Fox level 20 gem, six cards, bad. Doppelganger, bad. You know, a mirror arrow for two cards. No one cares. It's basically like buying a GCP. Survivalist, seven alchemies for three cards. This is one that's good to farm if alchemies are very, very expensive. Uh, but it's not one that's good to flip because typically, uh, you know, three cards for seven alchemies, even if you're paying one C per card, uh, which nobody really sells cards for under a chaos, you're just going to be losing money. So not very good. Magical's Grasp uh, for four cards is bad. Grave Knowledge, a random, or sorry, Summon Raging Spirit with 20 quality. Again, it's just six cards for a gem that's worth a couple chaos, not worth. Uh, the Jester is a merciless one-handed weapon. Same exact situation that I mentioned earlier. You don't know the one-hand weapon that you're going to get. And it's a blue weapon, which means there's just so many things that can go wrong, especially for a nine-card set, absolutely not worth. Mercenary, you don't know what you're going to get, and it's corrupted, bad. Inoculated is a Seraphim's Armor, which is a uh, which is a role which I believe is like uh, is it Evasion and ES or something like that. Overall, just bad. You don't even know what you're going to get. Uh, loyalty is five cards for three fusings. And again, nobody really sells cards for under a chaos, so bad. Pride Before the Fall is the exact same thing I already mentioned when, I, uh, when it came to the non-corrupted version, but this is the corrupted version. Uh, the only difference here is because it's corrupted, you want to keep in mind what I said about the minus 20% from the beginning of the video. Audacity, five cards for a once a unique, no thanks. Assassin's Dagger, nine cards, and you don't know what you're going to get, no thanks. Same thing for Hunter's Resolves, eight card for a random bow, always going to be trash pretty much. All right, Skull of the Sea is a, a Malkin map for seven cards. If Malkin map is extremely expensive for some odd reason, and the card is cheap, it can be good. But overall, remember, pe people never really sell Divination cards for under a Chaos each, that, which means you're paying 7C for Malkin. So unless it's like a T14 plus map or something, it's typically not going to be good. All right, Doriani's Fist, uh, but for nine cards, no thanks. A random staff from the tower. Now, uh, this is one that you would think could be good because you can get a Tremor Rod from this, and it's only six cards. Now, the problem is uh, there's a lot of staffs that you can get from this. So if we are from this uh, of staves, right? So... If you look at the the ones that you can get, uh, where is it? Oh, it doesn't even say. But there's quite a few unique staffs. Uh, so the odds of getting something like a Tremor Rod, which is like pretty much the only staff that's worth anything, is very, very low. So in my opinion, that's a stay away from. Uh, Gemini uh, Claw of Celebration. Again, eight cards. You don't, you don't get a prefix. You don't get to choose anything like that. Sure, Celebration is nice. It's T1 attack speed. Item level 83 is also good. It means you can get things like Flaring, Merciless, uh, and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, eight cards and uh, you don't really have any control over uh, the other modifiers is very just too risky and not worth the time. Our right, Anarchist Prize is 13 cards for a Corrupted Vault Axe Crypt. You know, maybe seven years ago, but not anymore. Uh, the Lich, 12 cards for a Midnight Gar Bargain. Again, maybe seven years ago, but not anymore. Uh, Shabron's Revelation, which I believe is the ring, uh, but for eight cards and it's corrupted, no thanks. Uh, the Asti, uh, or the Asthete, I don't know how to pronounce this, 
Eight cards for an item which you have no control over. Could be good, could be bad. Probably going to be bad. And remember, one, one C per card. Uh, overall, just not worth the time. Enlightened, same exact thing that I mentioned earlier, but this is for a level three. This one is actually very, very solid. Uh, definitely a card that you want to keep your eyes on to, especially early league, because there's a lot of builds which will require a level three Enlightened in order to even work, period. Uh, not necessarily level four, but a level three. So it's definitely something you want to keep in mind. And you can also do the math on it, whether it's worth to corrupt them in order to get a level four, potentially. I believe it's a one in eight. So it's there's quite a bit of gambling going on there. But yeah, the online is definitely one that you want to have in your arsenal. Hunter's Reward is actually quite good. The Taming is not an extremely expensive item, but the thing is, it's only three cards. Uh, and it is a pretty rare card, but for only three of them, it's going to be pretty hard to really push the price up. So Hunter's Reward is definitely one that you want to keep your eyes on especially early league because the taming offers a ton of damage and also a ton of resistance for any elemental builds that are basically attack base uh so it's a very very solid card all right the fletcher five cards for collect corrupted drill neck no thanks surveyor is a t14 map with four cards it's the exact same thing that i was mentioned earlier about that t15 map right if you haven't dropped the t14 or let's just say you're in yellow maps but your characters are the point where it can go start farming bosses well it's time to basically take some shortcuts and something like the Surveyor is a very, very good option to, um, I guess, cheat your way to T14 maps very, very early. Uh, the Boyer's Dream. This is one of the cards that can be decent. Now, the problem is a Harbinger Bow is very slow and typically League Star characters are all about uh, things that are going to be attacking quickly. Attack speed based characters like Talk Train, Caustic Arrow, Elemental Hits. They don't really care about that crit implicit all that much. Uh, so it's it's a, I guess you could say it's a subpar option, but it's only six cards and the bow is item level 91, which means it can roll everything in the game, including plus two arrows. Uh, so, you know, if there's a if this card is drastically cheaper than the other ones, it's something to consider. Or if minor bow builds are popular, things like I shot mines, which doesn't care whatsoever about the attack speed on the bow, then this card is actually really, really good because the implicit is going to apply to the mines and you don't care about the attack speed. So it's one that you do want to keep your eyes on, but only if you know what you're doing when it comes to crafting bows and the bow meta and whatnot all right surgeon surgeon flask you don't know what you're getting it's four cards not worth the time uh volatile power you don't know what you're gonna get it's corrupted 20 quality nine cards absolutely not worth last hope is uh a modal hope which is one of the two rarest fragments from uber Ziri, and it's only three cards so if uber Ziri fragments are very expensive for one reason or another this can be a good way to get the hope fragments uh which is one of the rare uh with the ignorance fragment of course um being the rarest i believe all right hubris again you don't know what you're gonna get and it's five cards for a, ra a random ring and there's a ton of different rings so absolutely not worth uh same exact thing here it's seven cards and the ring is corrupted so even worse than hubris in every way merciless armament again right as i was saying earlier merciless is great but it's a two-handed weapon you don't know what you're gonna get 99 percent of the time the bases are going to be bad therefore not worth the time in my opinion even if it's a four card set Cartographer is one card for 10 chisels, so typically people are just going to turn it in. They're not going to sell it, uh, but you know there is some profit to be made there if people are uh, are going to be selling this, and chisels are very expensive. So let's say chisels are 2 to 1. That means that this card is worth 5C. If people are selling for 1 or 2C, there, there's definitely a profit there. All right, uh, the Warlord is actually a very, very solid divination card because it gives you a Coronal Maul, which is super good for minion builds. Uh, and it's item level 83, which means it can roll everything that you need in order to craft a minion uh, mace. Now, I'm not going to go over how to craft these because it's not a crafting video. But it's a six-card set for a six-link item level 83, which is exactly what you need uh, to craft minion mace-type weapons. Now, the problem is people have mostly been using minion bows uh, recently. But it's still a card that you absolutely want to keep your, uh, your eyes on if you know what you're doing. And, of course, if the meta is uh people using uh rare weapons for their summoners right so there there is definitely uh i guess you could say some parameters which need to be met in order for this card to gain a lot of value uh but it's one thing that you absolutely want to keep in mind because uh it is six link and fusings are worth a lot in a league start scenario so definitely want to, definitely a card that i've made a lot of profit uh with in the past uh, the Monus, five links, uh, five cards for Death Sands, absolutely not worth. A random corrupted one, not worth with the trader. 
The Offering is the same exact situation than Pride Before the Fall or the other one for like Combs Heart. It's a very, very good card. Uh, typically, the profit margin is going to be fairly slim, but the thing is there's a ton of demand for Shav's wrappings typically, uh, for Chavron's wrappings, so there's actually a lot of potential. This is definitely one of the cards that you uh, want to pay very close attention to because it's super common and there's a ton of demand for the item that comes from it. So again, as long as the worst case scenario is profit or at least breaking even, remember that you can get some good rolls on the ES and the lightning resistance on this item and therefore you're going to make a lot of profit when that's when that happens. So offering is good. All right, Lost World, map T15, eight cards. Already spoken about that. Same situation. Good way to, I guess you could say, skip the Atlas. Uh, it is eight cards, however, which is slightly annoying. Uh, Lord in Black, uh, Ring of Bamoth, 83, not worth. Uh, Fertile Mind, six cards, absolutely, absolutely garbage. Random unique armor. Now, the thing is, most armors, 99% of them basically really suck, and it's a four card set. Nobody really sells cards for under a chaos, which means you're paying four chaos for random armors, which are 99% of the time going to be garbage. Absolutely not worth. Uh, Passivism, Corrupted for three uh, cards. I don't even know why this card exists. Uh, Glimmer of Hope, it's a gold ring. But the thing is, it's eight cards, and you don't know what you're going to get again. So you could get, like, some better gold rings, but you could also get some worse ones. Uh, for example, I'm not sure if it's going to say which you can get here. It doesn't seem like it does. Uh, but you could get, like, uh, the uh, the quantity ring, right? But the thing is, even within the quantity ring, there's a lot of things that are going to dictate whether it's worth a lot. Like, the amount of quantity on it, resistance, life. It's just too big of a gamble. And it, remember, one C per card, you're paying 8C for a ring. Could be Anvarius, which is worth absolutely nothing. Could be, uh, you know, quite a few different options that are not worth the time. So in my opinion, Glimmer of Hope is a nope. Ethereal is a very, very good card. And the thing about this is I believe it drops from Normal Aziri, from or not necessarily herself, but the, the area of Normal Aziri. It might be Uber, I don't quite remember. It is a 7-on card set, which is a bit annoying to the buy, but it's not that rare. And it does give you a 6-link Val Regalia, which is a very good base. So this is definitely one that you do want to keep in mind. You can easily use fossils like dense fossil spamming or even essences to get a decently high ES and resistance piece of armor. And then you can sell that for a good profit. So ethereal is very, very strong. Uh, Prosperity, Perenda's Gold Ring, no thanks. The Sigil, a, an unassa uh, unassailable amulet, which I believe is T1% energy shield. Absolutely not. You don't know what you're going to get. Uh, Dapper's Prodigy, same situation. Except it's it's kind of like an in between the celestial Justicar and the chains that bind because it does give you a six link, right? And it is a body armor, which means you have no control over it. But the advantage and why this one is better in my opinion than chains that bind is that it's item level one hundred. Because it's item level one hundred, uh, you can actually get all T one mods on it, right? You can get T one life, T one resistances, T one re anything, right? Uh, which means it does have more potential, and it's a six-card set versus the Chains That Bind being an 11-card set. So this one is definitely a very, very solid option for the first couple days of League when people are, are, are in, in need of links on their builds. All right, Rabbit Roa, Malicious, Gemini Claw. No thanks. That I believe Malicious is flat chaos damage. And item level 83, Gemini, just bad. Nothing to say there. Soul Taker can be very good. Soul Taker is is made to uh, is used to make the King's Maker, which is used on uh, anime guardians, I believe. Uh, so it is a very very in demand item typically. Uh, so you do want to do the math on it. Remember not to trust these sort of websites, these sort of applications that will tell you that something is is profit because it's just pulling numbers that can in some cases be you know completely wrong. Uh, but yeah, the soul is good. All right, Lion. The thing about this one is that it's an RNG card. You could get, you know, the bow, the chess piece, the boots, whatever. There's too much RNG involved, in my opinion, to be worth. That being said, it's a very good card in Solo Self Found. People farm the Mud Flats in Act 6 for this card a lot. Uh, but in Trade League, absolutely not. That's a skip for me. Dragon, Coruscating, Elixir, 1C Flash for 4 cards. Just overall never worth it. Rat's Nest for 8 cards. Not worth it either. Rat's Nest is very, very cheap. All right, Vendor Scample. That's the gold ring that I was talking about earlier with the quantity. It's a random one, and it's three cards. This is one that can actually be good because you know you're getting a Venter's Gamble. Now, you don't know if the Venter's Gamble is going to be good or bad, but the thing is you can easily do the math on this. Let's just say a random Venter's Gamble of any kind because people use to, uh, people divine them to see if they can make profit off of being lucky. Uh, let's just say it's 10C, and this card is like, I don't know, 5C. That means that you can get a Venter's Gamble for 15C, and the worst-case scenario, if you can just sell it to someone who's going to divine it, is that you're losing six chaos, but you've got 
potential to make one that's worth, let's say, I don't know, 1x to 2x to 5x to 10x, and let's just say just 10% quantity alone is an X, then there's actually quite a bit of profit margin to be made. And this is definitely one that you should keep in mind uh, when Ventures Gamble is, you know, in demand, which means typically when people are farming uh, with um, Magic Find. All right, Voltaxic Risk, seven card for once, a unique, no thanks. Her Mask, four cards for Sacrifice Fragments, no thanks. Anyways, no one ever sells this card. Uh, a Vault of Aziri, which is the map, but it's seven cards. In my opinion, not worth it. It's rare that Vault of Aziri is anywhere near seven chaos. And remember, people typically don't sell cards for under a chaos, so no, no for me. Earth Drinker is a Granite Flask. Now, the cool thing about this card, which you don't know what you're going to get, but both of the Granite Flasks are actually typically pretty good. If I remember correctly, yeah, you get Lion's Roar, which is a good card, and you also get Rumi's Concoction, which is a good card. Or sorry, which is a, a, a good flask, right? So both options are pretty good. And the thing is, Lion's Roar can have a good bit of value depending on the roll. And Rumi's Concussion can also have a lot of additional value depending on the roll. So in some in some cases where these diff these two different flasks are pretty meta, and let's just say that the price of the card is like 1C and the price of worst case scenario for Lion's Roar or Rumi is, is 5C, that means that it's physically impossible to lose money. You're, al you're always at least going to break even. And given the rolls, you can actually make a profit. So Earth Drinker is one that I would absolutely keep in mind in a League Start scenario. It's also a very, very common card. I believe it even drops in some leveling areas. Uh, I can't quite remember about that though. Uh, so yeah, pretty, pretty common card. And it's only a five set, which is not too, too annoying to... Uh, yeah, as you can see, it, it drops in Vesteria Desert and Oasis and Foothills. So very, very common card. Uh, so you do want to keep that one in mind. This is like a first half of the first day sort of card uh, where you can make a good bit of profit to get going because early, even 5 Chaos is a good bit of money. All right, yeah, High on Fury is garbage and it's three cards, so that's trash. Uh, Colosse Colosseum map, 10 cards, typically not going to be worth the time. But again, remember if Colosseum is a high tier map and you know, you're know you trying to cheese your way through the Alice, it's something that you can consider, but for 10 cards, eh. All right, Sephiroth, you get 10 Divine Orbs for 11 cards. So this is one of these ones kind of like equivalent to the uh, the Exalt ones. Typically, the, the value on these, right, the potential for profit is going to be very, very slim because there's a lot of people who know about these cards and because you are trading currency for currency, essentially, right? There's no middle ground. There's no medium where you need to sell the item to someone else. You're, you're just outright getting money. Uh, so it's one that typically has a very low profit margins, but it's one that uh, people tend to forget about because it's not exalts, it's defines. So I would say that the Sephiroth is actually one that you can, uh, definitely, definitely keep in mind. And the cool thing about it is that it actually drops in leveling zones. Uh, so any, any of the map that I, be uh, I believe that Dominus is the, uh, uh, is the boss it can drop. All right, Visionary is a li lionized vision for six cards. Absolutely not worth the time. Stormcloud for five cards, not worth the time. You know, you're talking about 1C items for multiple divination cards. It's just not worth it. Uh, Dying Anguish, random level 19 gems with alternate quality can be okay. But remember that most of the alternate quality gems are absolutely worthless. So it's just nothing special. And it's a set of eight cards, which is just meh. All right, the Immortal is kind of the same situation that I was talking about earlier with the House of Mirrors, except this is one-tenth of a House of Mirrors instead of being one-tenth of a mirror itself or one-ninth of a mirror. Uh, so typically going to be very overpriced uh, early league. Um, now, the problem also with that card is that it only drops from uh, Hall of Grandmasters. Now, I believe it also drops, of course, from stacked decks or from uh, Divin uh, Diviners. But otherwise, it's a Hall of Grandmaster card. So typically, people who farm these are going to be keeping them. Uh, but it's one, th it's one card that you do want to keep in mind or at least have a quick look once in a while uh, because sometimes... If there's none of them that are legitimately priced from people farming them who understand their value, uh, and it's just ones that are you know dropping from diviners or stacked decks, sometimes they are drastically, drastically underpriced. Uh, and because it's basically a tenth of a ninth of a mirror, right? You need so many of these, you need 90 of these to even make a mirror. Typically, they're actually very, very affordable. So you can start investing into them early, and they do gain value as mirrors gain value, of course. All right, two, two cards for Combs Roots. Now, they are corrupted, which means they cannot be enchanted, which automatically is going to make it very hard to sell. But there are some very, very good outcomes from this. Uh, now, the only issue uh, with these boots or, and, and with this card is that Combs Roots is not really a popular pair of boots, but two cards. So it's one that you want to keep in mind when Combs Roots are a very popular uh, unique. All right, Boundless uh, Realm, random map, four cards, no thanks. 
uh, Devastator at Zero's Disfavor, which is the axe I was talking about. Now, the only issue is that it's corrupted, and it's eight cards, so that's a no thanks from me. Uh, there's not really any corruptions that are going to add more value than simply having, you know, actual quality on your axe and being able to link it uh, because, you know, it is a six link potential. Uh, but when it comes corrupted, you need to actually pay the same amount of Valor's infusings to link it using the bench, uh, which makes it just a bad option in my opinion. Uh, Destined Crumble, Random Body Armor, Garbage. Uh, Vivid Jewel basically means that it's a jewel with percent life on it. Uh, but again... Nobody's going to pay 4C for a jewel with just percent life on it with a uh, blue. And four cards would it would mean that that's what has, needs to happen. So, in my opinion, not worth. Heterochromia is a two-stone ring. Now, the thing about this is that there's not many two-stone rings um, that are unique, that are, like, not in demand ever. So, you've got the Barracks rings. Uh, Barracks for Spite being the best one. Now, this, is, this card is weighted. I believe it's been tested. But you also have Call of the Brotherhood, which is also good. Rigol's Quest, not great. Grip and Fast, not great. But you have Respite and Call of the Brotherhood, which are both solid options. And the advantage here is that it's a two-card set. So because it's a two-card set, and I believe this card drops in in uh, pretty... Yeah, it drops in Estuary map, which is typically a pretty low tier, right? Uh, so because it's a low tier map, mostly every league... And because it drops quite a few of the the uh, the good rings, it's one that you absolutely want to keep in mind. And basically, what you want to look at is the price of Grip, Pass, Respite, Call of the Brotherhood, and Rigwald's Crest, right? Look at the price of these different uniques. Look at the price of the card. And it should be pretty obvious to know, uh, you know, whether it seems worth it or not. Uh, because uh, some leagues, Grip and Pass, even though they're just outright not very good rings and not very sought after, are actually uh, pretty meta. And if that happens, then this is definitely a card that you want to keep in mind. All right, a strand map level 73 for nine cards. Absolutely not worth it. The Void, that's a gamble. There's a lot of videos on YouTube you can find about people gambling it. Not worth it. Merciless Weapon, item level 100. Great. Now the only issue is it's nine cards and you don't know what you're going to get. Not worth it. The Web, Weapon of Crafting, which is a weapon that you don't know what it's going to be. And it's eight cards. And the only thing that happens is I believe it comes with one of the meta mods, which is like prefixes cannot be changed or... You know, can't have multiple crafted mods or whatever. Just overall bad. The Harvester is a... Uh, the Harvest is, if I remember correctly, a random jewel, I think. Or maybe it's the, the Scythe weapon. I actually don't remember. But it's 11 cards and some 1C items. So, either way, it's bad. Uh, Sire of Shards, 5 cards, 1C item, bad. Emperor of Purity, we're going back to these 6 links. Now, the problem with this card is that the item level is 60. Which means that if you're doing this card... Now, it is a 7 card set which is not bad, and it is a Holy Chain Mill, which is not the worst base ever, but it's item level 60, uh, which instantly is going to drastically decrease the value of it. Now, the thing about it, though, is if we look at PoE Holy Chain Mill, um, if we look at Holy Chain Mill, there's only a single unique, which is Balls Protector. So what that means is that in a league where Vols Protector is very, very uh, good or, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Meta, right? You can actually use this card to get a six link uh, Holy Chainmail. And then you can use the Trash to Treasure Prophecy to turn that into a Vols Protector because it is the only outcome. Now, the thing is, typically this chess piece is not good uh, and uh, it's not in demand almost ever, but... You know, it's a possibility that if it ever happened, then Emperor of Purity would be pretty cool. Otherwise, you know, you know the drill. Use essences, use fossils. Typically, on a very low level item like 60, because it blocks so many mods from being such a low level item, essences are going to be better because essences will actually bypass the item level uh, for the mods that they can roll. All right, Curse King, Rigol's Curse, eight cards. Pretty much never worth it, but if Rigol's Curse is really, really expensive for one reason or another, it's one thing that you can consider. It is non corrupted. Uh, Agnarod staff for four cards. Typically, Agnarod staffs go for anywhere between two to five C, and it's four cards, which means you'd be paying like four C, just overall not worth. Uh, a random A gate amulet, you don't know what you're going to get. It's six card, it's corrupted garbage. Cartography's Delight, it's a T5 map for three cards. Now, the advantage of this card here is that it drops in leveling zones, it drops in the Harbor Bridge and the Foothills. So, because it drops in leveling zones, and because it's actually only three card set, uh, in some cases, T5 maps in a League Start scenario are going to be in demand, or not only in demand to be able to sell them, but also to be able to speedrun your Atlas, right? So there, there should not really be any T5 maps in the inner region of their Atlas. So what you can do, essentially, is buy these cards to, uh, I guess you could say, 
bypass your atlas completion and go directly into the outer zones to be able to start working on your conquerors from the very very get-go it's a problem that happens to, uh, like fairly often that people will get stuck in t1 to t4 maps and unable to reach the outskirts of the atlas so this is a solution for that all right lucky uh lucky deck 10 stack decks for nine cards absolutely not worth uh, unless, let's say this card is, I don't know, like a Chaos each, and the stack decks and bolts are 2C each, then that means you're trading 9C for 20 Chaos worth of value. It's one thing that you can consider, uh, but it does depend on the price of stack decks in bulk, and of course the price of this card. Alright, Light and Truth, Crystal Scepter, don't know what you're going to get, not worth. Uh, look at the Valve, Valve Gauntlets, don't know what you're going to get, not really good uh, either, if I remember correctly. Uh, let me see, look at the Valve. Yeah, right, so you have uh, acuities, which are typically quite good, but they're going to be corrupted, which means you don't have any control over being able to, you know, divine them and stuff like that, or even enchant them. But the other option is Doriani's Fist, and we we all know that every single divination card is weighted, so most of the time you're probably going to get this and not that, uh, which makes it a bit too much of a gamble, in my opinion, because uh, the way that weighting works in this game, and the reason, for example, why one of the earlier uniques that I was talking about, the helmets, was actually good, is that that specific helmet, Devoto's Devotion and Bringer of Rain, are about the same in terms of rarity, so it's about a 50-50. But if we look at gauntlets like this, Doriani's Fist is many, many times more common than Aziri's Acuities, which is why that's not a good option in my book. All right, Vivid Crimson Jewel, again, not worth the time, I already mentioned that. Unset Ring, you don't know what you're going to get, it's a five-card set, most of them suck, not worth uh, the Wolf for a Rigwald item, again, you don't know what you're going to get. Five cards, in my opinion, not worth. Uh, the Allied subjuga uh, Subjugation is a 23 quality support gem, which is great, but it's a seven card, and you don't know what the support gem is going to be. In most cases, you don't care too much about the quality. You'd much rather have a level 21 gem, so in my opinion, not worth. The Calling, a random Beyond item, don't know what you're going to get. Six cards, not worth. Valkyrie, Nemesis item. A lot of people love you know, uh, gambling for Headhunter with this item. Or sorry, with the di divination card, it's about the only real option that you have when it comes to this divination card. But you do need to uh, note that it is weighted, so your odds of getting anything remotely good is very, very low. Right, the odds of actually popping a headhunter out of this is basically non-existent. Now, one thing to note about this though uh, is that if you want to do it as a gamble, you know, later on in the league, sure, go for it. But early league, I would always, always go for things that are. Uh, basically guaranteed, and I would never gamble, so that's a no for me. The Formless Sea, Varanastra, that was seven years ago. It was a pretty good div card, but nobody uses Varanastra anymore. Uh, and for seven cards, it's not worth. Same situation with Death Oats. Nobody really uses it anymore, and it's a super common unique. Chances are you're not going to have to pay 10 or 6C for a Death's Oath. Carcass Jack. Carcass Jack is the same situation. Nobody really uses this anymore outside of the league start scenario so this is actually a very very good card actually probably one of the better cards in your day one to day two flips it's one that you absolutely want to keep in your arsenal because carcass jack has a ton of demand early there's many 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 bills that can use it and it's overall a very good chess piece uh but it is eight cards which is kind of annoying uh but it's a pretty common card it's definitely not a a, a high rarity card so let's just say carcass is going for i don't know 50 c and this card is like up to six seven chaos there is potential for uh for profit especially due to the fact that remember this right as i mentioned earlier it's all about worst case scenario we're not losing money so if the worst case scenario of a carcass jack is cheaper or sorry is the same price or more expensive than the price of these eight cards right then you're basically good to go. Even if the worst case scenario is breaking even because you're not going to be losing money. And when you get a good roll, if you get a good roll, let's say of high life or, you know, area damage, area of effect, you can actually get carcass jacks that are worth many, many multiple times the value of a base carcass jack, uh, which that's where basically you're going to make the most of your monies when you get lucky. Uh, so, and because it's a very common card, well, you're going to be able to get uh, quite a few of these sets done. So absolutely great card. All right, Marblade, Eyes of the Great Wolf, 16 cards. It's a huge gamble. I would stay away from it. Porcupine, very, 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 very good card. Now, the problem with this is that it's item level 50, and to get plus two bow gems on a bow, you need it to be item level 55. So what that means is that if you do use the Porcupine in order to make a six-link short bow, which is a great base for things like Toxic Crane, of course, the problem is you can't get plus two bow gems, which forces you into using Essences of Dread in order to get the plus two bow, uh, sorry, plus two bow gems on your item, and that automatically makes it so, in my opinion, you're better off going with the alternatives and going with fossils instead of with higher item level bow and completely ignoring 
uh, Essences of Dread. That being said, you can definitely make a lot of profit with this card uh, because typically just just simply buying this card in a League Star scenario, six of them, which is pretty easy to buy, and they're very common as well. Uh, you can then sell the the the, the six link short bow, not even crafted whatsoever, and people will basically pay more than what the six cards are worth. So you'll already be making a profit there. And if you want to go further, you can craft them with Essence of Dread. And then make even more profit along the way. So it is a very, very solid card in a League Start scenario. We're talking about the first couple days. All right, Lightning Coil, eight cards, absolutely garbage. Astramentis, three cards, very, very good. Astramentis is used uh, quite often in League Start scenario on some League Starter builds. Now, the whole strength stacking, um, strength stacking minions is what really made this card absolutely or Astramentis is super, super com uh, popular in meta back in the days of, I believe, Metamorph is where everybody was using uh, Astramentis. But nowadays, uh, it's definitely no longer uh, a card or, sorry, an item that a lot of people prioritize getting. But it's only three cards, and typically Astramentis... Remember this, there's a large roll, right? There's a very large margin of rolls. So if, worst case scenario, you're not losing money, then there's, there's, this is obviously going to be a good card because if you get a good roll and then you can either further enhance it using uh, in, Intrinsic Catalyst, you can get your Astramentis to be worth a, you know, many, many times the value of these three cards. So Polymath is definitely one that you do want to keep in mind. Wolverine is a claw. You don't know what you're going to get. It's corrupted. Bad. Mitts, don't know what you're going to get. Five cards. Bad. Wretched. Same exact thing than the Nemesis one. You're right. Sure, you can gamble for Headhunter on this. Uh, but it's six cards. It's a pretty common card. It's typically not too, too expensive. It's one that you can do later on in the league when you have more currency. But in my opinion, in a league start, absolutely stay away from any gamble. So no thanks. Rigol's kills, eight cards. I remember flipping these back in uh, Incursion and making an absolute killing. I was making so much currency off of these cards. But nowadays, Rigol's kills has been fixed, right? There was a bug when it comes to the fork of it. It was double forking or something. But they uh, fixed that. So yeah, not exactly a good card anymore. Uh, not exactly a whole lot of profit to be made, and it is a pretty rare card. That being said, in a leak start scenario, if Rigold Skills is worth anything, this card is typically going to be very, very cheap. Uh, so there is some profit to be made. Something that you don't necessarily want to emph emphasize on and pay too much attention to, but having a quick look at it once in a while is not a bad idea. All right, standoff, Rustic Sash, overall just bad, right? Three cards, but you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, Ambilius Immortalis is the belt, if I remember correctly. Uh, seven cards for a belt that that's very very cheap not worth uh garris power is a jewel there's like a hundred different jewels not worth uh lingering remnants same situation if you want to cheese your your way through the alice and get you know to very high tier maps quickly it's one thing that you can buy the problem is it's 16 cards uh which is a lot of cards right so and and it's corrupted you don't even know if your build is going to be able to run the map so overall not a great option uh but if you're trying to cheese your way through the Alice, it's one thing that you can do. All right, Spark of the Flame is typically very, very good, and it's a two-card set, which means you don't need people to be farming a million of these cards in order to be able to make multiple sets. Uh, and Barracks Respite is a pretty good ring, typically by itself. A lot of people use Barracks Respite on their builds alone, but you can also buy Barracks, uh, Barracks Pass and Barracks Grip and then make it into the Taming by vendoring all three, if I remember correctly. Uh, is the vendor recipe and that will give you um, the taming which is typically going to be even further profit uh, so yeah this card is one that you absolutely absolutely want to pay a uh, very close attention to uh, by looking at the price of this card twice barracks grip barracks pass and then of course the taming as the outcome um, and typically you're going to be making a decent bit of profit on these cards some sometimes it's up to 10 chaos per card it's actually pretty crazy uh, because it's a two card set a lot of people uh, basically undercut them pretty heavily all right saint's treasure is the exact same thing as all the other cards that are related to currency that i've already mentioned so it's kind of whatever typically going to be very little profit margins a lot of the time is going to be botted heavily whatever uh but there's profit to be made if you get there early call the first ones random talisman five cards don't know what you're gonna get absolutely awful value uh, steel boxes is a nine card set for monster treasure now, Monster Treasure is uh, a very, very, very strong prophecy for farming six links, and the problem with it is that it's pretty rare, uh, so a lot of the time it's going to be very, very overpriced. Meanwhile, this card drops from uh, strong boxes, right? Uh, so it's actually pretty common. Uh, so a lot of the time you're going to be able to make quite a bit of money off of buying these cards early and then selling the Monster Treasure, or better yet, farming the Monster Treasure, let's say in Glenna Carnes, with tamper-proof 
uh, on your on your Atlas nodes and just getting a ton of six links. Uh, so there's many videos about this, you know, six link farming uh, strategy. You can easily look those up. All right, Might is Right is a nine card set for Tripanon, which is absolutely garbage. I don't even know why this exists. Opulent, five card for item level 100 ring. Again, I don't know why this is a thing. Absolutely garbage card. Struck by Lightning, Electrocuting Jewelry, item level 76, which is too low. Three cards, not not too many cards, but overall, it's just bad. You don't even know what you're going to get. Could be a power ring, right? So, no thanks. Ezir's Arsenal, random weapon, and it's corrupted. Absolutely garbage. Uh, Megalord's Girdle, which is a 1C item for 7 cards, and it's corrupted. Absolute garbage. No traces. 9 cards for 30 scours. Now, if scours are very, very expensive, which is the case in some leagues, uh, for example, this league, they were really expensive at the league start, you are getting 30 of them for 9 of these cards. So let's just say that scours are, I don't know, 1.5 to 1. You're technically getting 15 chaos worth of scours. And let's just say this card is 1C. That means that you get it for 9C and turn your 9C into 15C of pure currency. Uh, because it's easy to sell scours. Um, so there's there's some potential there. You do want to pay attention to this one. But I would say that it's one that, again, any card that is related directly to uh, to currency, from currency to currency, is very, very hard uh, to flip. Because a lot of the time, uh, either people don't sell them or outright they are heavily, heavily botted. All right. So I think I'm going to be ending the first part of this video here. I've been going for over an hour. Uh, so I'm going to be making a second part. Looks like we're about halfway done. Uh, nope, maybe not. A lot more than halfway, maybe. Uh, but I will be making a second part of this video to finish off the rest. Uh, hopefully you guys are basically gaining a lot of knowledge from, uh, from uh, every single one of these divination cards and my explanation of them. Now, I might make, like, uh, I guess, some timestamps to the more important cards. Uh, we'll see about that. But hopefully you guys are looking forward to the second part of the video. Before I go, however, I want to say a huge thank you to my supporters. Jordan, Fruitfly, Thomas, Nairoth, Master, Tim, Nake, Jacob, Flame Scorpion, Reese, Emil, Road to Millions, Alex, Brandon, Don, Joseph, Welcome Back, Panda, Atticus, Scott, Bar, Grimoire, Johnny, Ronald, Kevin, Mercury, and Bizen, as well as, of course, a massive thank you to anybody else who was uh, supporting me in the past or who wishes to remain anonymous. Peace.